The Oracle Network. Welcome to Brew Crime, the podcast where we drink brews and talk crime, conspiracies, or whatever catches our attention. This is Mike and my co-host. Hey, it's JT. All right, and we've got a special guest today. My name is Patrick Connor, and I'm a uh, brand new author of a book called Shot at a Brothel, The Spectacular Demise of Oscar Ringo Bonavena. Thanks so much for having me. Our pleasure. Uh, I love how long that name is. It's it got the whole noir thing where it's like got a title and then tons of descriptors. It's like old school. <laughs> it's it's honestly uh, it's brilliant. I wish I could take full credit for it, but that's got to be the the editor Kyle Seraphine from Hamilcar. He's a great guy, a uh, great editor. Came up with the title, and it's really it's perfect for a number of reasons. Obviously, because it's got brothel in huge <laughs> letters, and that's gonna. Right. <laughs> just about anybody is like room, you know. Yeah. Whoa. But then uh, after that, it's it's just it's simple. It sounds ridiculously simple, but you're imparting what happened. You're telling the story kind of just in the title without giving too much away. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like establishing a common fact, and everybody knows. I was shot at a brothel, you know. <laughs> but what I what I love about that is like you know what happened, right? And then it's like let's let's walk it back. Let's take it back. Let's go to the beginning. Get here. What? Where did this come from? You know, that's that's what the book's all about. Yeah, absolutely. The music comes. You know, in the past, <laughs> the old Wayne's World. Yeah, exactly. That, that intro music is fantastic, and I can definitely tell you, I'm not walking down that dark alley. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So I guess before we get talking about the new book here. Let's kind of go back a little bit. And uh, what's your like background in writing? Um, about 10 or so years ago, um, like I had written a handful of articles about boxing before that. Um, I never, I didn't get any writing degree or anything like that. I just kind of got interested. But, um, and then about 10 years ago, I got a little more serious because a friend of mine had a boxing blog um, and I just kind of scribbled some stuff up for him and he wrote me back and said, this is no good. What are you doing? I know you're better than that. And <laughs> it's supportive. All right. I was kind of like, all right, well, I guess I, I better try harder and just kind of develop from there. Um, and then through that, uh, writing, I developed an interest in, uh, mainly like boxing history, the historical aspects of boxing just fascinate me. So uh, that's that's kind of how I got hooked into both. Yeah, the the uh, boxing, I, and I'll be the first one to admit, like my knowledge of boxing is like very. It's a small amount. Um, I knew a little bit about the history, but not a ton. And I was actually talking to um, an undergrad assistant who works with us at my job, and I was like, "You you need to read this book." And I was actually talking. I was talking about your book, and I, you know, she. she she had no idea about like the underbelly of boxing or like the other, all the, uh, all the little, you know, the, all the small things that kind of made it go. Um, I say small things, probably big things. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it's really fascinating and just kind of what it attracts and kind of how that works out. Well, uh, definitely tell her I can get her a signed copy if Ooh. she needs it. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate the recommendation and it's there are so many moving parts in boxing that it's it's really like uh not to reach for a cliche but it really is like a symphony um there are just a lot of things that need to go right for especially bigger fights to come off um <clears throat> recently with the pandemic we've seen that that's a pretty big wrench in the equation right there but it's it's a truly fascinating sport from the standpoint of you could be around it for like decades and not like really understand how it works. 
Yeah. I mean, they make it look like you just kind of set up a ring and then you put two guys in the middle and you bring a bunch of people in. But there's so much more than just that. That's the funny thing is that sometimes it almost is that simple, even though it's yeah, it's it's just it's a funny thing that way. It's it's very nuanced. Um, But that's that's one of the things I enjoy about Uh, it's and I guess I look at boxing the same way as a lot of other people. I, I don't have any outside sports interests apart from combat sports, but mm-hmm. I know a lot of people are really into football and really into baseball, et cetera. And that's the same thing. I view boxing the same way they know who played shortstop on the 1967, whatever, you know? It's, yeah. It's the yeah. I mean, my sport is like NFL, but Canadian football, CFL, which is slight difference, but you know, yeah, that's my main sport that I watch. So we all have kind of that one sport usually. I'm just a nerd. I just roll dice. That's, that's, what, that's what I do. I do pay attention to sports to a degree, but I couldn't tell you like who played two days ago, you know, let alone, you know, stats don't roll off the tongue. Yeah. Um, but like we were talking about how hard it is to like set up an event, you know, especially like a big boxing match. And that happened a lot in your book. <laughs> it seems like um, Oscar was kind of like, like the pinnacle, like a hard shell to crack. Almost uh, kind of the epitome of always a bridesmaid, never a bride type of thing. Just never quite won the big one. Never yeah. quite became the star that a lot of people thought he could have or should have become. But yet he clearly crossed paths with not just in boxing, as if you read the book, you know, but especially in boxing even just two names in between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. Yeah. yeah. Those are the names of boxing. Um, and he almost got in with a couple other big names in George Foreman, Ken Norton. And had he got in with those four fighters, he kind of would have gotten in with what are probably considered um, it's, it's would be improper to say four Kings in, in that regard. Cause that's kind of like reserved for four completely separate fighters. But regardless uh like a, a holy foursome from yeah. the 1960s and early 70s heavyweights, which is considered the golden era or the best era or best chunk of time for heavyweight history. So the fact that Oscar Bonavena locked horns with just even two of them and gave them trouble is um, despite the fact that he wasn't able to kind of reach that pinnacle in and of itself. That's, that's pretty, it's pretty boss. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'd like to know, too, because you're big into the history of boxing. Is there something from boxing that really is interesting to you? Is it a certain boxer or, you know, the the underbelly of boxing that has a ton of crime in it or, you know, gangsters, all that kind of stuff? Uh, Is there a certain one that kind of really hits you? Um, Not to try to steal your show's thunder at all, but recently... On my own podcast, we've done a few kind of true crime episodes where fighters had died somewhat mysteriously. Um, we we haven't done it uh, a lot because, as I'm sure you guys know, it requires a lot of research. There's a lot of <laughs> yes. fact checking and we don't want to be the jerks who go on and say a bunch of nonsense. So, um, But I, I really enjoy reading kind of like the darker stories about boxing uh, as kind of weird as that might be to some people, obviously not you two. No, I was like, this sounds perfect. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think also just the the way that history intersects with boxing for me, um, there's something that, you know, if I would have written a full length book, I stu- I literally read two books about the economic development of Argentina. And, <laughs> wow. I mean, it was, it wound up being for almost nothing because it, it was like a paragraph in the book. Yeah. But even so, that's just kind of, I guess, the the thirst for knowledge or whatever. You can even just call it an obsession that I have or compulsion. And um, basically that, the way that those things all led into the story it was almost like you don't need to understand those things to read the story and enjoy it. But for me, it was almost like I needed to get that in order to understand where this was taking place, where people were coming from. And was it that necessary? Could I have written the book without it? Probably. It it might not have been that necessary, but I don't know. I guess I know a lot about Argentina's economy. now. (laughs) I mean, that's, that's called due diligence, right? I mean, it's, uh, 
you know, I, I don't know if you'd ever interview on an economic podcast, but hey, you're ready to go. Uh, <laughs> but really, in general, I mean, yeah, doing that research and then doing kind of like, um, I guess, tertiary research or ag- research adjacent to your topic is kind of a nice way to get a well-rounded feel for the whole thing. Um, it's like, you know, when Mike and I do our research, a lot of times we'll look at the city that the thing happened in. It's not just enough to look at the crime. It's like, what are some of the factors that could have led to it? Was it economic? Was it, you know, what was it? Um, and also, I, I think, I think you, you had a point where you were just talking about just how kind of pivotal boxing was in terms of history. And it's amazing the kind of themes that weave into boxing, like whether it's race or economy or anything like that. Um, Boxing seems to kind of represent some of the things that go on uh, in the surrounding culture. Yeah, there's absolutely no question. And uh, I actually, I think in my very first draft had written something about this where the development of technology, and there was a small chunk about the radios and what they were used for in Buenos Aires in the book, but um, you know, the, one of the first things ever videotaped on a, on any sort of camera whatsoever on the kinetoscope by Edison was boxing. No way. And one of the very first things ever broadcast over radio boxing, you know, one of the very first things ever broadcast by video boxing. And so it, it really, it's, it's almost kind of like, you have to look back and be like, what happened? What, why was it so tied into the technology and culture and everything then? And what happened? And obviously there's, that's its whole other podcast and everything, but, um, it's, it really is, it, it really is like just fascinating the way that boxing has adhered itself onto especially American culture or did in, yeah. in decades past. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it, it's like, they're really inseparable and the way that boxing's kind of forgotten in the history books in that regard is like, it's, it's kind of unfortunate. Yeah. Agreed, yeah. I'm in total agreement. It's it's definitely something that I'm super glad that you're covering because it really like, obviously, I don't know much about it, you know, but it's really I, I, I find the history fascinating. I mean, and what you just said just drove me to want to look more stuff up. I mean, it might not be the economics of Buenos Aires, but or Argentina, but, you know, I mean, the history of boxing is 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 quite um, it's quite involved in terms of like our development as it just our nation. And that just, I mean, I'd imagine that the depth of research necessary for just our nation of the U S is, is intense. So. Yeah, it's um, it definitely, as much as I read, as much as I study or research, you never really get a feeling like you fully grasp it. And I guess that's kind of the point. Um, If you ever really feel like you do, then who are you? What, What are we doing here? (laughs) <laughs> you think you know too much. Yeah. You right. Learn more. But I mean, it's that's just kind of the point is uh, I really love learning about that and being surprised. And then a big a big part of it for me um, and, and a challenge, too, is figuring out how to then pass that along, like how to impart what I've learned with the same enthusiasm. And it's it's not it doesn't always come through because not everybody's interested in that. But um, but it, it's interesting stuff to me. And so I, I, I tried my best, I think, in the in the book to um, well, and with the help of the editors, obviously to pick and choose things that were relevant and weren't going to bore people, but were you know like fascinating tidbits or things that people might not already know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to jump to questions, Mike, but I think it's a good segue into, you know, <clears throat> you did get me very interested. Your passion was real. I mean, I could read that from page to page and something that I noticed, and I don't know whether it was purposeful or, 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 just an accident but like your depictions of the fights were awesome um in fact and and i noticed this that kind of when the fight slowed down or when they were wrapped up with each other kind of i read slower and when things picked up i read a lot faster and like that it's it's wild that i thought it was so great that the the book and the way that it reads goes like especially in those moments goes with the tempo of the actual fight so i don't know if that was i don't know if that was intentional but um, it kept me moving, like, quickly, you know? Um, it, this was my first book, so I, I learned a lot, obviously, yeah. uh, about publishing and about writing a book. But um, there was, needless to say, considerable editing that had to happen. Enough that, like, not so much that I would say anything like, 
oh, it's not my book or I didn't write that because I wrote everything. Yeah. But I definitely got a considerable amount of help from the editors um, in the flow and the overall story. And kind of uh, it took me a while to understand how to kind of match the pace of this story with the pace of that story, how to make it so that Joe Conforte and Oscar Bonavena were clearly it like going to intersect at some point. When was it going to be and why? Yeah. And that, that was kind of the whole point is how to figure that out. And they helped me with that a lot. Um, and so with the fights though, that was one of the few things where Kyle Seraphine, the editor, he like, he didn't even touch it. He was like, I, I don't know what you did here, but you need to leave these alone. <laughs> and I, I guess that's one of the, one of the things that, um, I've learned and I just have read so much as far as fight recaps and, you know, especially from history and great writers and everything that I feel as though that's like one, one of the things that I feel comfortable doing in terms of writing um, where I could whip it out pretty easily. Other things it's like uh, I see other writers and they just vroom, you know, zoom through stuff. And I'm like sitting there twilling my thumbs. Like, how do I start this? I get writers pretty bad yeah. in that regard. Um, but those things, they came easy because I wrote those watching the fights. Um, it didn't, it doesn't make sense to me to read about the fights and say, well, this is what happened. Cause that's what this person said. It makes more sense to me to watch the fight and try to just relay what I'm feeling watching it. You know, like what, what, is, what are you watching? And so another thing that was kind of important for me to remember is that it's not a biography and it's not a boxing book per se. Yeah. It's a true crime book. So I didn't want to get too hung up on those fights, but it's Oscar Bonavena fighting Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. It's like, you, you can't skip over those. You have right. to. <laughs> That's kind it's of an, it's a bookmark. Yeah. And I mean, like as a person, again, like I'm not big into boxing, but I mean, I grew up knowing who Muhammad Ali was. Like you just knew, right. You knew who Fraser was, like Frazier was. Even if you didn't watch that closely, that was the culture. You knew it. So yeah, you gotta yeah. you gotta touch on those things. And and I love hearing about your process because whatever you did, your editor was right not to touch it because it came out onto the page exactly how I hope you intended it. Um, it was quite it it was awesome to read. Let me I'll just leave it at that. I, like I was super impressed by that and not that I'm anybody that it needs to be impressed in terms of like my credentials. I've never written a book, but I was just super impressed by the by the uh the tempo um of how that that all worked. So I just wanted to point that out and um I hope that I hope that everybody else who reads the book sees that because it's a lot of work that goes into that. That is not simple, you know, at all. And I hope no, I mean, it reads as if it just flew out of your hands and it may have, um, but uh, you know, it, it just, it, it's so smooth, you know, it's a lot like, I guess, like a, a boxer style, you know, you just, you're, you're bobbing and weaving and you're keeping it smooth. So, yeah. Well, I, I do appreciate that. And I do think that there's something to be said for the fact that you might not be experienced reading those things and that you were able to kind of hook into it nonetheless. Um, so that makes me feel good. You know, I, I take that as a compliment for sure, uh, just as I would take it as a compliment with for anyone who has a lot of experience going, wow, that's good. You know, I, I appreciate that. I do. Since we're talking about the book now, Shot in a, bro shot in a Brothel, how did you come to pick this uh, case? Like, did you have this in mind or was this something that Hamilcar kind of said, Hey, why don't you look at this or how'd that come about? Well, it's not unusual um, for me to be looking things up uh, randomly. For instance, um, <clears throat> both on Facebook and on Twitter, I run a couple of boxing history accounts where frequently I will share things like this such and such happened on this date in 1970 or 1930 or whatever. Um, and so it's, it's pretty common for me to be looking things up as I'm doing those things or downloading a whole bunch of articles and reading through them and stuff like that. Cause I do a lot of research anyway. Yeah. Uh, and so I think what wound up happening if I have the timing right in my head was that 
it was early December and it was the anniversary of Ali Bonavena. And I had looked up a bunch of stuff about that fight, gotten intrigued and thought, wait, didn't Oscar Bonavena have some weird death or end or what happened? And I wound up looking into it. And since I have a, a few subscriptions to uh, old newspaper websites, I just went and I found everything I could from local, like uh, Las Vegas, Reno area, Northern California area to try to see. Uh, and I downloaded probably like 200 articles because I'm just a lunatic like that. <laughs> yeah. and, like, and so I, I got fairly familiar with the story, but I didn't really, I was like, ah, oh, maybe I'll write something about this, like an article. Like, this is pretty interesting, but I didn't really read it word for word. I didn't really study it or anything like that, but it nonetheless intrigued me. And then probably... I don't know, it must, it could have been days later, but maybe weeks later, whatever it was, I wound up being approached uh, by the guys at Hamilcar if I wanted to write, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, if I wanted to host a podcast for them, which I have done, but it's, it's just kind of slowed down as uh, the books have picked up. Yeah. But in any case, um, they then asked if I wanted to write because they Googled me and they were like, oh, wait, you do writing? Oh, shit, you do a bunch of crime, right? You've written, you've written about <laughs> like boxing and crime stuff well, dang that kind of figures into this thing we're we're working on like do you have any ideas about anything you'd like to write about is there any crazy crime stories and i was like hey i just read about oscar bonavena and they were like wait t tell me a little bit more about this you know and i just kind of broke it down like maybe a handful of points and they were like uh yeah i think that's something you should definitely write about <laughs> that's about right <laughs> so i mean it it really was somewhat like coincidental serendipitous uh, that it worked out this way. Um, and then I've been able to uh, thankfully kind of join the Hamilcar team and help them. Uh, yeah. Just try to push a number of these great books by really, really good authors. Yeah. Cause we, we've, we've talked to, with my former co-hosts, we talked to is it Don Strat Stradley, is it? Yeah. Yeah. And Don Strad I think you talked to, you talked to Jimmy Tobin. Too, That's it. Jimmy Tobin. That's, yeah. There we yeah. go. Yeah. So yeah, we've uh, we've talked to a couple of the guys now and uh, read really interesting books. I really liked Slaughter in the Streets by Don Stradley. That's such an interesting book because it's just straight up all of the different gangsters from the East Coast, all like so intertwined with all of the boxing stuff. It was just like holy shit. <laughs> he's he's an incredible writer. Yeah. He really is a really good writer. Um, and he and he's one of the writers that bust stuff out too. Um, like I, I wish I could do things like that. And he's, and he's quality too. Yeah. He's not just turning in crap. So, um, yeah, that was a great book. Um, his book about Edwin Valero, really, really good book, but a lot of this stuff is really dark <laughs> and doesn't oh, yeah. bother you obviously, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's rough. You know, a lot of this subject matter, uh, is fairly rough. I think my book tends to have, it's, it's a little bit more light, it has some a little bit more levity than some of the other books, but it's it still wind winds up in a fairly dark place. Yeah, but there's a there's a very nice balance there, and there is something for everybody, you know, to the point where I did recommend the book to a 19 year old female undergrad who was working with us. You know, like I felt like she would get something out of the book too. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a very nice balance of the two sides. What was it kind of like to write about? Obviously, Oscar was a good fighter. I mean, he did, he did pretty well, you know, but he was also so self-destructive. Um, what was it kind of like kind of writing that? And what was kind of your, your thoughts going through that? Well, I think that um, it was actually like being fairly candid. It was actually um, weird because as I read more about him, I saw more and more that he was really like standing in his own way, both in life and in his career. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, I, I don't want to make the podcast all about me per se, but like, no. that's, I can that's relate. It. It's and this I, episode. I, know <laughs> I know that it's something a lot of people can relate to that kind of like, you know, screwing yourself up, making mistakes like over and over again, or, <laughs> Yep. And I felt at the time, um, whether or not it was like concocted into my mind, I felt like I was doing that and was like, damn, 
I kind of feel like I understand this dude right now. So, I mean, it, it, uh, nonetheless, I could see the nuance that he was, it, it took me a little bit because of how much I saw and how many of the things that he said before fights that were like pretty awful. And it took me a while to also kind of be like, all right, he's not just an asshole. He's not just like a dickhead. He's, he's a human. Mm -hmm. He's a complex guy. Mm -hmm. And there are things happening that are, you know, I'm not saying, well, this isn't his fault. It's everything going on around him. But nonetheless, it's, it's, it's a uh, puzzle where everything's going together. You know, there's already some sort of proclivity or some sort of predetermined whatever that, you know, in his behavior, but then you add in the environmental influences and yeah. you get, get, and you get somebody who was self-destructive and who was very harmful to himself and people around him. So um, I think that kind of delving in, it was difficult for me to not judge too much because so much of it was like, I wanted to write and be like, Hey, everybody get a load of this fucking guy. This guy <laughs> yep. you know, this guy's a jerk, but, it, but I had to kind of understand that like I could say that and I can do that, but n not in a way where I'm just saying pointing and laughing and saying, Hey, everybody hate this guy. Yeah. Well, I mean, he was almost, he was trying to rip off Muhammad Ali doing a bad job, throwing a little bit of racism in there to try to get, you know, the eyes on him but <laughs> yeah it just i think a lot of it probably started out as a show to try to get eyes on him and it just kind of spiraled and it can happen he he did definitely seem to kind of have the air of a guy who couldn't help himself yeah. yeah yeah and i mean i think i think the book does a good job i mean they always say in english class show don't tell right and so I think the book does a really good job showing who he was rather than just saying, hey, look at this guy. Right. Like you said, I mean, it'd be a really short book. So <laughs> so I mean, I think I think uh, I think it knocked it out of the park in that way, because as you kind of unlock different chapters and points in the book, you unlock a little bit more about him and then the whole story in general, of course, until the intersection. And um, it just it, it really played well. It worked well. So, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, it was it was tough kind of getting that pacing right. And it was tough. Uh, I, I think especially because um, I guess I don't want to re reveal too much, yeah, no, but for sure. it's fairly easy information to find. So it's not like I'm on, I'm really revealing any secrets or mysteries. But um, early on, as he was an amateur, as Oscar Bonavena was an amateur, he bites one of his opponents so it's kind of like you get a, a, an idea very early on in the book and in his career that he's willing to do things that a lot of other fighters, just nobody even thinks to do that in a ring, much less, you know, has the ability and will to do it. So you, you kind of see pretty early on that uh, it's leaning in one direction. But yeah, it, it keeping the human part of him, that, it wasn't easy. So hopefully I did that. But um, yeah, it was... He's definitely uh, Joe Conforte is his own character in the book and a fascinating character. And so is Oscar Bonavena. Yeah. And I guess uh, Mike Tyson isn't the only hungry boxer. <laughs> Go for a little bite. <laughs> no, that's it's actually happened way more than you might think. Like it's there's uh, you. I bet you if you went on to YouTube, I, you probably could right now and look up boxers who bit an opponent and there's probably like 15 videos of it happening oh, i mean probably. it's that's obviously the most notorious you know of of the bunch but uh anyway it's it's pretty crazy i guess not to not to say that like oh it's really common it's not that big a deal it's a big deal big deal yeah it, it's just that it it's i guess more people get the idea to do that than you'd really think but just oscar bonavana was one of the ones who did it so it's he's in that hallowed group I think when it comes down to it, you just get uh, these alpha males or whatever that are their whole life is training to fight. And then they get in the ring and they fight. And it just sometimes when you're just when the adrenaline goes, it's just you're not thinking you're just getting pissed off because things aren't going right. And you might do something even <laughs> dumber than you would think you'd do. I right? mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but I get really psyched that I just want to like just bite off a fingertip or something. I just get really <laughs> super excited about something <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. i think honestly the the alpha male thing is it's 
while a lot of people might dismiss that as like a buzzword, that's pretty spot on. Yeah. Cause that really is the culture of a lot of combat sports where it's very, very bro y, very yeah. y. And it's, uh, you, you can also see, like, for instance, in the, in the book, Oscar Bonavena does a lot of stuff like pulling pranks that are like really bullyish, just kind of just being a dick, yeah. you know, being a big brother that's not a nice guy. <laughs> that's, that's kind of the kind of stuff he does. And yeah. to me, very like alpha male where it's like, oh, well, you're, you're not as big as me. You're not as tough as me. I'm going to push you. I'm going to yeah. trip you, do some shit to you. And it's, it's like, damn, that's jerky, man. What yeah. I mean, you get a lot of these boxers that come from poor neighborhoods, you know, rough upbringings, and they're used to having that kind of like fight for everything. They go to some of these gyms and they become, you know, these gods, like everyone wants to do everything for them. And I'm sure it just, it gets so easy to just, this is how I get what I want, <laughs> you know? I think that it, while it's kind of stereotyped or cliched, there is something to that. Yeah. There, honestly, there's something to the psychology behind that, that, um, you know, having to constantly feel as though you have to react to something physically, you know, having to feel as though you have to do something like that is it's that's that develops a, uh, conditioning like the it conditions somebody to react that way i think in life yeah and to and to you know think that things are harsh so uh, yeah it's it's cliche but i think also true and the reason why true is because you see it so often in boxing yeah yeah i mean like i mean it's yeah a lot of the guys do seem like it's not enough to just pull the chair out from under you it's like i gotta pull the chair out and then watch you fall off the stage too so it's you know it's one of those deals for sure did you find it hard to find any information from like a lot of the sources? I would guess it'd have to be in Spanish and stuff for his hometown stuff. I'm guessing you didn't head down to the brothel in Reno. So, <laughs> but we don't judge if you yeah, did. No. It's fine. No, <laughs> Mustang, Mustang Mustang Ranch. Ranch. Yeah. It is open, as far as I know. Uh, I don't know if it's open right now in the pandemic, but yeah. as far as I know, open as at least a sort of attraction um in a kind of a mausoleum or something but um basically it was difficult finding a lot of things from oscar bonavanna's earlier career because kind of as i said earlier um i didn't have to i didn't have to go into a lot of detail and i didn't have to find much but for me it was like i felt i felt as though just repeating things that everybody already knew like there's no fun in that either for me or for them there's no fun in like they they already know that they already know basically what happened, but like uh, they already know how he got basically to the U S at least a lot of boxing fans are history, boxing yeah. history, but I needed good anecdotes. I needed good little short tid tidbits that would kind of be a vehicle to get me there. And so it was difficult finding things from earlier in his career because um, a lot of the stuff was in Argentina. There was a handful of sports magazines or even uh, gossip kind of magazines in Argentina that were constantly publishing things about Oscar Bonavena even early in his career. Um, but getting those things over to the U.S., it would be like the magazine was like seven or eight bucks, but the shipping was like 35 bucks. And so it was like, well, what am I going to be doing? Like spending $1,900 to get all of this stuff for a really short book, not to sell the book short, of course, it's just that it wasn't practical. No, it yeah. just didn't make sense. So I found what I could find. Um, and luckily I speak enough Spanish that I could do my own searching. Um, so I, and I'm fairly resourceful when it comes to researching. And so I was able to find some things that might have been more difficult for other people to find uh, otherwise. So yeah, it was difficult, although I was able to kind of get a couple tricks in there and find some stuff. Nice. Yeah, it's funny because I, I was doing a – after reading about the Mustang Ranch, and I've I've definitely heard about it before, I was looking. And it turns out they have like a museum there, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. It's so, – um, uh, Yeah. <laughs> I, I asked before the show if you knew of Joe Conforte, if you'd heard his, his name and you'd said no, which is – I mean, I wouldn't expect that to be common knowledge, but – in this particular part of Nevada, everybody knows Joe Conforte yeah. or everybody knows his name or they know Mustang. 
Or they're so, pretending that they don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or they don't want to. Yeah. They're yeah. just they like to forget it. Um, and you read the book and you'll see why, obviously. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's it's definitely very much kind of like a time capsule of a particular part uh, or a particular time in Reno. It just in, in that particular part of Nevada, in the kind of high desert of Nevada, that's very, um, it's very like almost like cowboyish, like old Westy. And you wouldn't really think of Reno that way, especially now, you know, knowing it as like a gambling destination or like a mini Las Vegas or yeah. something. Mm-hmm. It seemed mm-hmm. like a kind of a, an old Westy town or anything like that, a dusty town. But it really is. And that was something that I, that I grasped very early on that everybody knew each other and everybody was getting into the same trouble and stuff like that. And so uh, in the context of it being like a museum, Mustang being a museum, it's like that place is like going to never die. <laughs> I guess it's it's carved out its its hole in the desert. I think so. Well, I mean, as a Canadian who the only time two times I've been to Nevada was Las Vegas. I've never been to Reno. I've known about Mustang Ranch for a long time because it's probably the most famous brothel in the world. Probably the the uh, story that was done in Rolling Stone was massive at the time. And so for a short period of time, for a few years, must like a lot of people outside of Reno knew Mustang from that story. And and it wasn't just that story too, because after that story picked up, the way that, as we know, a lot of media moves is that it's like, uh, it's like magnetic, you know, all of a sudden, it's, and, and a game of telephone, but it's, it's just kind of like this organization gets it. And now all of these other things need to, whoa, prostitution over there. We need to write about that too. Yeah. So that's kind of how it worked was that it all just disseminated out. And Joe Conforte loved it. He loved the attention. He loved uh, his name being out there. And so right in the late sixties and early seventies, uh, Mustang ranch was, was big. It was kind of like, uh, what maybe 15, 20 years ago, everybody knew what, I th- what was it like the bunny ranch, I think in, in Nevada or the, oh, don't know. I'm pretty sure that's like the, the famous, like uh, that little portion of Nevada that's just outside of Las Vegas and has left prostitution ambiguously legal. I'm pretty sure it was like the, the bunny ranch or something like that. That was like the famous uh, brothel out there. And anyway, they yeah. did an HBO show about it, I'm pretty sure. And anyway, same thing. A lot of people knew about it because it was scandalous and it was crazy. So that's how it worked. It's quite fascinating um, that Conforte, that, that he chose Reno um, for for a couple of reasons. One, I mean, you know, his, his ego for sure, like wanting to be known, wanting that kind of thing. That makes sense for him. Uh, but a lot of folks that want to start up those kind of uh, those kind of businesses or that kind of those deals and transactions, they're not going to pick a place where everybody knows your name like it's Cheers. You know what I mean? <laughs> but but he also seemed to capitalize off of that, and, you know, because he had dirt and was able to I don't want to give away too much. We can cut yeah. that out if you want to. Um, so but it's an interesting choice for him. It makes sense kind of with his character, but also criminal wise. <laughs> you know not not entirely the brightest <laughs> well you know uh making your way in the world today it takes everything you got no, i'm just kidding <laughs> no it's you know you got places like lake tahoe reno las vegas these uh laughlin these cities that are usually they're not very big and they've almost all been staked out initially by gangsters, by mobsters. Oh, yeah. Almost, and almost all of the money going through these places, these gambling hubs, is like old money, mob money, or was really uh, promoted or propped up by the mob early on. And Reno is no exception. Reno uh, was along with – Reno was considered fairly early on almost like a satellite with Lake Tahoe. Like a lot of the people who ran stuff in Reno ran stuff in Lake Tahoe and, you know, vice versa, because it was a fairly easy stop to make, um, you know, back when there weren't flight, you know, easy flights and yeah. stuff leaving time. Uh, you could fairly easily drive from Reno to Lake Tahoe, for instance. And so um, 
with the mob being involved in a lot of the gambling money here. And it, it's pretty much just a rule of thumb. If there are large sums of money, literally anywhere, doing anything, somebody's taken some of it. It's like, or somebody's laundering something with it. Oh, yeah. Uh, the gambling's no exception. Reno's no exception. And boxing is no exception. And one of the things that I say in the book is that, and I don't think this is really giving anything away either, but one of the things I say in the book is that um, boxing is considered one of the world's biggest or oldest money laundering op operations. I mean, perhaps not oldest, but uh, I guess America's oldest. Yeah. Because it's the same thing even now. Uh, there's so many large sums of money to make and skimming off the top large sums of money is pretty easy to do. So in Reno, uh, it's easy for Joe Conforte, who is already, by the time he leaves San Francisco, gotten in trouble for having his own brothel. Mm -hmm. And so it's like once you're already in trouble, you know, where you have to go somewhere. So it's or you have to kind of go somewhere where you can find cover. And that's that's what I think Reno was all about. And the struggle was Joe Conforte trying to find cover, this larger than life guy who probably didn't really belong anywhere in this little desert town, trying to make peace with the people who were from this town. And he, he does that in some funny ways. <laughs> <laughs> he does that in some fascinating ways. I don't want to take like any of the 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 points away from the book. You're gonna to have to read it, y'all. Yeah. Um, Conforte is is a, he's a he's a fascinating fella. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a he's just as fascinating as Bonavina because like they're just they're both wild people. They got... <laughs> There's there are a lot of things with Conforte. Um, I'll stop giving things away, but there are a lot of things with Conforte in the book where um, I really had to read between the lines to find a lot of these facts or make these connections. There are, so I mean, I, I guess to talk about other books or, or things that have been written about the subject, there have been a handful. Um, I think probably the biggest one was Joe Conforte's autobiography, but how reliable is that right? in <laughs> any way whatsoever? I'm going to put that right next to Charles Manson's. Right, yeah. <laughs> It's just not very, no, it's not very believable. No. Just, we got a character witness problem here. Yeah. So, <laughs> and so it's, it's, you have a handful of these books that have been written usually from kind of a biographical perspective. And I think that what I did was unique in the sense that I compiled a lot of things and kind of drew them into one um, where there were things from Joe Conforte's past that he bragged about, but they were only a little true. And like, when you start digging it, what was actually true, it was like, whoa, that was something I wasn't expecting. Yeah. And so you kind of you start going through the book and you start, especially if you're a crime fan or a true crime fan, you start seeing names that you might be familiar with, or you might've read about a couple of times and go, wait, what? That guy was, he knew him or he knew him or he, you know, was involved in some way with him. And so um, all of these kind of associations, a lot of these associations were like almost in passing as if the writers who were initially mentioning them, mentioning them in the newspaper didn't yet understand what that meant. So it was like they only mentioned it like in a sentence or two, not realizing that they had just given me like like as a writer, like. It almost blew. There were two or three instances in the book where I was like, "He knew him," <laughs> and just kind of thought well, that kind of that changes the whole direction of this. And so it well, and it just gave me ammo. I guess it didn't really change directions, but in any case, um, it was really fascinating to see that Joe Conforte was involved with a lot of these characters who themselves were involved in setting up these gambling mob cities. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, obviously, we've been talking about the book. We want to promote the book. Um, I did want to ask, I mean, there's, you love the history of boxing. And I know that informs a lot of probably how you see modern day boxing um, or contemporary boxing. I'm not sure what the right phrase is. But like, I guess my question really is like, how do you feel about present day boxing? I mean, there's still like a spectacle. There's a build up. Sometimes there's flat out nastiness. We've seen it recently, I think, with some stuff going on. But 
and I'll, I'll leave it there. Like, how do you feel about the way modern boxing has, has progressed or regressed? Well, um, I think that you almost have to view boxing from previous eras is almost a different sport than what it is now. Um, and you almost have to view what we have now as a business more than a sport or as much as, as a sport. Because ultimately, two fighters still have to get in and face each other. Now, ultimately, something has to happen. But at the same time, um, there are a lot of things about the way boxing is presented to the public and to its fans now and what is considered important in boxing that has changed so much. For instance, um, just, and this is gonna sound almost like insane when I say this, especially to somebody who's not a boxing fan or is not like a, not a regular boxing fan. Mm -hmm. The natural progression of a fighter is assuming they're good or they get to this level they beat this person and this person and this person and, and steadily go up the rankings until, you know, it's like a, a, the field is whittled down and there's one contender or two contenders or something like that. Right. Sure. Just the natural in a video game. It's the natural progression, everything. Right. That's just not how boxing works now. And I say that and people are just like, wait, what? So how does it work? What do you mean? And it's just kind of like uh, the, that kind of clarity isn't as important as it used to be. Now, what's important, just like in media, is what gets clicks, what drives viewerships, what drives subscriptions, what drives sponsorship. Those kinds of things, just like in podcasts, movies, music, etc. It's not. It's not always even whether or not it's good. It's just. It has to just be attention grabbing. Yeah. And that's something that we're seeing really like steroided up with a lot of these celebrity boxing matches um, where it, this is not something that's killing boxing. It's not something that's a problem with boxing. It's, it's, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of everything going on in boxing. And it's almost like saying, Oh, look at these supermarket rags. You know, what kind of filthy companies are putting these supermarket rags out? And you have to stop and say, bro, people are buying that shit. Yeah. They wouldn't fucking make it if people didn't buy it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Same kind of thing. People, they wouldn't be putting on this celebrity boxing if people didn't watch it. If people I mean, weren't in. It, they didn't move them. So for so as far as contemporary boxing goes, I still love it. It's still boxing to me, but you almost have to have a sense of humor about it. You have to embrace the silliness of it, because if you don't, you're just going to be mad at it all the time. <laughs> that literally sounds like any time that I talk to somebody who's a fan of like professional wrestling, like, like you just have to take a sense of humor with it at this point, yeah. let it suspend. You have to suspend your belief. And then if you don't, you're just going to be pissed. Yeah. You're just going to be an angry person. Well, I mean, it's not much different than like the, the, the culture of social media these days with these, like all right. these famous people for, you know, being like half naked or whatever. It's just like influencers, influencers. It's like being famous for no reason or, or musicians that aren't very good, but they've just got a really good marketer. Right. Yeah. Or they, or they have 90 million YouTube subscribers. Yeah, so they exactly. sell 30 million copies on their first week because it's, yeah, it's, and that's, that's what matters though. You know, yeah. that's, and um, I guess we don't, sounding old when we say stuff like that but it's but it's it is an observation and it's true yeah and right. it applies to boxing and other combat sports yeah well i, I can say this uh, i hope you sell 30 million copies <laughs> <laughs> I, I truly do too yeah. you like that segue that's a very <laughs> nice segue <laughs> that's not bad it wasn't bad at all um mike you got anything else oh well i guess we can kind of slowly wrap her up here so Shot at a Brothel is coming out soon. What's the release date? All right, it might be out in Europe already, I think I saw. Yeah, the, re the release date in the UK was, the publishing date was August 19th. And it was initially going to be August 17th, but Amazon is doing some weird stuff. Who knows what they're doing? They Launching, you know, yeah, sad things. Exactly. They're using all that money to go to space. Or almost space. <laughs> Get out of the space, my book, buddy. What are you doing? 
I don't know what he's thinking. He, he knew took my your book, book to space. Out. Who, who, come on, who goes to space when my book's coming out? Yeah, that's obviously, what I'm geez, saying. Bad that's guy. What I'm saying. A bad guy. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's coming out on the 31st now, but I've noticed that people who are ordering it now are getting it anyway. So I don't know what the deal with that is, but nonetheless, it's available. It will be out very shortly. And uh, anyway, it sounds like so far it's getting a pretty good reception. Nice. That's good. I, I really enjoyed the book. Um, I've enjoyed all three of the Hamilcar books that I've read so far. Um, and I guess, are you planning on writing any more books? Yeah. I would really like to. Yeah. I think that, well, I will. I'm sure that I will. It's just a question of when and about what um, I feel as though I like, I needed to get, I needed to pop the cork, you know, I needed to kind of get that first one through and now like, we're okay. I think I can do it now. Yeah. So I, I feel as though it went out a little bit better now. I well, mean, for, for whatever my opinion's worth, Hamilcar, you need to contract another book <laughs> with this man. Yeah. End of story. <laughs> would you be interested more in another true crime style noir book, or would you be interested more in like one of the more pure boxing books? Because I know they do both. Or they do quite a few different styles of books, it seems. Um, I think that for there to be a kind of pure boxing book or a bigger book, just practically speaking and having no uh, bearing on Hamilcar or anything, it's just the market. I think it has to be something pretty big and something pretty all encompassing. And so it's, it's tough to get a bigger boxing book, any book, but yeah. especially a boxing book uh, published or to get a script bought. But um, I definitely would be open to doing more true crime and there's no shortage whatsoever of true crime stories in boxing. And, and I kind of had, I have had my eye on a, on a couple cause now I'm kind of like, what are we going to do next? <laughs> I'm ready. That's awesome. Yeah, I think Mike and I are part of a, obviously like this true crime kind of Facebook group. And uh, we always say consistently, like we wish that we didn't have a job. Like we, we, we wish that, cause that meant that things weren't happening, but it never <laughs> fails. The world gives us more. Yeah. So, totally. Yep. All right. Well, I guess before we uh, kind of close it out here, um, why don't you mention your podcasts? Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, like I said, I haven't done a uh, Hannibal slash Ham Hamilcar Publications podcast for a little bit, but uh, nonetheless, there are probably about a dozen pretty cool episodes to go through if anybody's interested. Usually I talk with authors and other kind of uh, writers and people like that on that podcast, but then I do a more history and recently crime slash history based boxing podcast with my buddy Eris Pina. It's called Knuckles and Gloves Boxing Radio um it's we've been around for i think i want to say 2012 or 2013 so we've been doing yeah. it a long time yeah and, um you know it's it's a lot of fun and i appreciate let me plug it no I plug away <laughs> mike and i are very much of a like if we like the art form we're gonna plug the heck out of it you know whether it's on mic off mic it doesn't matter yeah like, exactly. we support artists because we I mean, to a degree, we are, I guess, in a way. So we hope that that goes both ways, you know. But that, that if it doesn't, that's fine. We still support, we support good stuff and yeah, from exactly. good people. So I wasn't even aware that there was a true crime podcast that had anything to do with beer. And that's like marrying two of my, you know, beloved worlds at this point. So I'm, well, I'm <laughs> you are welcome on whenever. <laughs> well, I guess, you know what? Since you are a beer fan, and that's right, I forgot about that. Uh, do you have some favorite beers? Yeah, we got locked in talking about the book. I, and I, I forgot about the beer too, but yes, I do definitely have some favorite beers. Um, lately I've been really enjoying, there's Fort George brewery up, uh, I think it's just South of Seattle. Um, and they have a couple of beers that I really like because I'm, I'm one of those stanky ass IPA fans. Everybody's always, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm one of the hipsters, whatever. But uh, no, I, I just like, I like good tasting beer. I don't like beer that tastes like bitter or that's difficult to drink. And uh, I don't really like champagne or fruit beer as it were either. But IPAs and certain kind of hops, uh, especially from the Pacific Northwest, seem to take on fruit really yeah. nicely. Mm -hmm. And a couple of these beers from Fort George, uh, there's one called City of Dreams that's like a, a pretty light IPA that's really good. And then there's the Optimist. And they both have a very kind of like papaya slash pineapple 
uh, forward flavor. Nice. Um, that's kind of like a base that I get for the fruit. And it's, it's good. Those are probably my favorites right now. I'll have to look those up. I don't get a lot of that for George up here, but, um, you know, things change pre pandemic. There was a lot more American beer here than there is currently, but I'll have to keep my eye open for that. Or when the borders slowly reopen, <laughs> I'll have to t- try them out. What, they're closed what, and they're open. What kinds of beers are you guys usually drinking? Ah, I'm I'm big into IPAs, like both the old like old school West Coast IPA that were just like pine and bitterness, but also like that New England like fruity IPA. I love imperial stouts and barley wines and. I yeah, I, like I usually I always say that I like the beers that I can substitute for meals. Um, <laughs> I really enjoy dark stuff, you know, like like in a, a good stout is solid um there's a hardywood brewing right down the road from me i I, i'm in richmond virginia which is like there's a ton of breweries in here you know it's a ton and hardywood brewing is one if i said the name people would know exactly where i'm at it doesn't matter at this point so um but they have a really nice raspberry stout that that is super solid and it's not too fruity but it's just enough so uh yeah i like beers that substitute for meals (laughs) And it shows. <laughs> well, that's kind of, that just comes with being a beer lover, unless you have like, you know, really fortunate genetics or something. It's, it's just how it is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, I don't have those good genetics. <laughs> yeah. That, that's why I got the beard. You know, it distracts from everything else. Absolutely. And hey, it's not often that my beard is not the longest beard on a podcast. So I'm loving it. <laughs> yeah. Getting out of control, but it's the pandemic. Y'all blame the pandemic. The pandemic beard. <laughs> it works. I like it. I guess. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to uh, let the listeners know about the the book or about your writing or anything? Really, just like plug away. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, really, I'd, I'd probably take the opportunity to say I really, really appreciate the guys from Hamilcar. Um, I I know that it's like you know I work with them and have done a book for them. So it's obviously I'm biased, but they really are really good guys. Uh, I really appreciate them and the work that they're doing, not just in boxing and true crime because they're, they're uh, well, we're branching out genre wise a little bit. There is a lot of overlap for sure. And that's kind of the name of the game is that we're not just branching out abruptly. There's definitely a lot of kind of Venn diagram stuff going on. So the stuff that they're, that we have planned and the stuff that's already been put out, I mean, I can't speak highly enough about it. They're really big on quality and quality writing. And so I feel really fortunate to be among this group and to be considered like my writing is good enough to be among this group because they have some phenomenal writers. So I would urge anybody to, uh, if you go on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookshop.org, um, or you can even literally just go into your local bookshop and you can ask them to order the books and they'll order them. You know, they'll, it's not a big deal. And I would encourage people to, if you're, if you're a fan of boxing, true crime, and there's a lot of, like I said, overlapping kind of interests here. Uh, if you're into, there's several kind of South American based, uh, books and whatnot in the Hamilcar repertoire. So, so, I think I, I saw something on beatboxing and then hip hop. Yep. There's, we're kind of, uh, branching into jazz, hip hop. Um, yeah. I mean, for right now, I think that that's probably it that we can say, but it's, it's, it's moving along and it's, it's really going quickly. I can say here too, I'm looking, um, in Canada, it is definitely available at Indigo chapters. Um, on it's currently in stock online. It's not in any of the stores. It doesn't sound like currently, but I'm sure if you talk to the local stores, they'll bring it in too, right? Well, and it sounds like um, there was a pretty big flurry of activity when it when it kind of came out in the UK, and then in the days following that, when it was supposed to come out, which is nice. But I'd like to I'd like to really get it going for the official public uh, official publication date. And anytime anybody goes in and asks a book a bookstore to order it or gets it somewhere new. It's, it's better for the book. It's better for me. It's better for everybody, really. Oh, so, for sure, yeah. yeah. Like, we've got, we, me and JT have a friend, Emily G. Thompson, who writes crime, 
and I walked into one of the local bookstores and it was so cool to walk in and look and I found one of her books and I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> I so. haven't gotten I haven't gotten there quite yet where anybody said, "Hey, your book's in this shop," but hopefully we'll get there. Well, it's just it's not out in a lot of shops yet. That's the problem, right? So just gotta get it out first. I feel like for for you, it's not gonna be an if; it's it's a when, yeah. and it's a matter of time, my friend. It's because I it's a I've, really impressive book, and uh, thank you for being on Brew Crime. I think this has been great, and it's been great talking to you. I love talking to the person behind the behind the book, so. I, I appreciate you guys having me, uh, Michael and GT, and I think that you probably earned a uh, fan in me. I'm gonna be listening to the podcast. Awesome. Well, we uh, we hope you enjoyed the show then. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been great, and we really hope this book sells well, and we can't wait to share it with all of our listeners. I have the same hope, and uh, make me rich, guys. Come on, let's go. <laughs> you got it. Just just throwing the money, right? <laughs> Go. <laughs> All right. Have a good one, man. All right. Take it easy, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, we really hope you'll pick up this book and take a read. It was really interesting. And even if you don't like boxing, like either of us, it had a great ability to pull you in and keep you wanting to read pages. It's the perfect length. It's the perfect rhythm. And it keeps you moving in three parts that are so easily readable in just a couple of nights. It's so well done. Um, I highly recommend it to everybody. So hop to your local bookstore. Hop to, I mean, you can even hop to Amazon if you want, um, which is in space. So good luck. But um, <laughs> but in any of the places at all that, that Patrick had mentioned. So thanks to Patrick for coming on to the show and sharing his work with us. I think you all will really enjoy it. Yeah, so just to help out, it's Patrick Connor, and the book is called Shot at a Brothel. And if you want the entire name, it's Shot at a Brothel, The Spectacular Demise of Oscar Ringo Bonavina. And that's from Hamilcar Noir, and which is Hamilcar Publications. And it's just their true crime wing. Yeah, and check out any of the podcasts that he mentioned. I mean, it's hard to keep a podcast running for a year, let alone long standing since 2012. So he's doing something right, y'all. Yeah. And I mean, if you remember uh, previous interviews we've done, we talked to Don Stradley, The Slaughter in the Streets, as well as his other book, uh, Berserk, uh, The Shocking Life and Death of Edwin Valero. And we talked to Jimmy Tobin, and he did the book Killed in Brazil, The Mysterious Death of Arturo Thunder Gotti. So. And they've got other true crime books we haven't read yet, and I'm actually interested in picking some of those up as well. So thanks for tuning in. If you want to send us an email, you can go to brewcrime at pacificbeerjat.com. If you want to find us on social media, go to at brewcrime. Check out our Facebook page and our Facebook group, Brew Crime the Group. We'd love to uh, get some more interaction on there. Facebook's been blowing up. It has lately. It doubled the size uh, in the past week. And uh, you guys need to join in. Uh, the more people, the better, because that means opinions yes. and thoughts and suggestions. So join us on uh, on Facebook. We love that. And uh, shout out to our Patreon supporters. The money from Patreon goes to upgrading equipment, making the show better. And Patreon supporters, as well as getting some bonus content, like an episode a month, you get your episodes ad-free. There's an RS feed in Patreon. So check that out. And um, the the money goes to making the show better. So that's great too. And you know, um, depending on what level you support us, there's some stickers, a shirt, all that kind of stuff involved. So shout out to our supporters, true crime, Nana, three beers in podcast, Amber and the faves of our lives. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm literally wearing a PlayStation four headset right now. So I need some help. <laughs> so join us on Patreon. <laughs> and, uh, also, um, we we always I always forget to mention it, but we got a T public store. If you look up Brew Crime, or you can go to our website brewcrime dot com, click on the link. We've got a couple different uh, logos. We've got different options: shirts and pillows and artwork and all like, phone cases. So if you want something with the Brew Crime logo on it, uh, check it out. And that's another thing: Patreon supporters. I think it's a ten percent discount on T public. There's a link on our Patreon. Yep. So, cheers. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>